Shalom Alehem. I bring peace unto you in the native Hebrew language of my Lord and Savior Yeshua HaMashiach, the one called Jesus Christ. Barah Hashem. Blessed be the name. Todo Rabba Yahweh. I thank God so much. You are now watching The Conservative Racer. The race is not over until Christ returns. Today we're going to talk about the Bible, the most read, the most printed, and the most beloved book in the history of the world. And yes, it is the inspired word of the Almighty God. People ask me, why do you read that Bible? You know it was written by man. Well, name me one book on earth that wasn't written by man. Of course man wrote it while being inspired by the Most High. The word inspired means they were divinely touched by God while writing down his instructions. And you see, this is the part that non-believers don't understand. In 1 Corinthians 3.16, it gives us a better understanding about the connection God has with us. It teaches that we are the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells within us. Do you really think for a minute that God who created the earth cannot direct the writing of his instructions to his people? Think about it. But before we continue, let's take a quick look at some Bible history and get some tips for studying the Bible more effectively. The number one best-selling book in all of history is the Bible. In fact, the Bible has sold over 5 billion copies and has been translated into more than 2,000 languages. The history of the Bible and how it came to be the most widely distributed book in the world is a remarkable story. The drama begins in antiquity, many centuries before Christ. The scribes, priests, prophets, and poets of the Hebrew people kept a record of their history with God, along with their inspired insights and hopes. Because these writings were a vital part of Hebrew life, they were carefully copied and recopied many times. As time went on, these sacred writings were gathered into three collections known as the Law, the Prophets, and the Writings. Eventually, these three collections came to be considered the canon, or official list, of the Hebrew Bible. However, when Alexander the Great and his successors conquered the ancient world, Greek became the common language of the people. So, in the 3rd century BCE, the Hebrew scriptures were translated into Greek for Jews and others living outside of Palestine. This Greek translation was called the Septuagint. It contained all the books of the Hebrew Bible, plus an extra seven books not originally in the Hebrew collection, called the Apocrypha. This was the Bible used by Jesus and the early church. Greek remained the common language for hundreds of years, so when the early Christians recorded the life of Jesus and the teachings of the Christian faith, they also wrote in Greek. The earliest writings of the New Testament are the letters of the Apostle Paul. He wrote to people in specific places, but other believers also wanted copies of Paul's teachings, so his letters began to circulate. The Gospels soon followed, as well as other letters, exhortations, sermons, and writings. Eventually, guided by the Spirit of God, the Church put together a collection that most accurately testified to Jesus Christ. By the end of the 4th century, Church councils reached a consensus, and the canon of the New Testament was officially recognized. Also in the 4th century, the Emperor Constantine authorized the creation of 50 copies of the complete scriptures, and possibly for the first time, the Old and the New Testaments came together as one book. Let's take a pause for just a moment, because I know some of the doubters might be thinking, yeah, the evil Emperor Constantine, the pagan ruler of Rome involved with the Bible? Let me ask you a question. Our Heavenly Father, the creator of all things, do you think he's limited in any way, shape, or form? 
Do you think he can't work through anyone he's created? Our Heavenly Father's will be done. Let's listen to some more Bible history and see who else God worked through to bring us his inspired word. Almost as soon as the Bible was formed, scholars began translating it into other languages for Christians living in other parts of the world. It was important to the early church that as many people as possible had access to the scriptures. The most significant translation of the early church was a Latin version called the Vulgate. A scholar named Jerome spent over 20 years living and studying in Palestine in order to make an official translation of the Hebrew and Greek scriptures into Latin. The Vulgate eventually became the official text of Western Christianity. However, the Latin-speaking Roman Empire fell in the 5th century, and tribes such as the Vandals, Goths, and Huns invaded Europe. Christian monasteries began to collect biblical texts, especially Jerome's Vulgate, preserving and copying them throughout the centuries. By this time, missionaries and soldiers had brought the gospel to the British Isles and translated the Vulgate into the common language of the people. But many rulers and church leaders felt that the scriptures and the popular language of the people challenged the church's authority. Even though Latin had long ceased to be the common language of the people, it became a crime to possess or circulate non-Latin copies of the Bible. However, not all leaders felt the same way. In England, late in the 14th century, a churchman and political figure named John Wycliffe and his followers translated the scriptures into the common language, and it was completed the year Wycliffe died. The authorities did all they could to suppress this English Bible, going so far as to dig up Wycliffe's body and burn it. They banned the use of any new translation, and many people were persecuted for copying or reading translated scriptures. In spite of this, the English people hungered to hear the biblical story in their own language. But copies of the Bible had to be made by hand, so complete Bibles were scarce and very expensive, until a printing breakthrough occurred in the middle of the 15th century. In Germany, a goldsmith named Johann Gutenberg created the printing press, allowing books to be printed on a machine rather than by hand or wood block. The first large book produced by Gutenberg's press was a Bible in Latin. So let me get this straight. A man in Germany creates this marvelous invention and the first thing he thinks to do with it is print the Bible. And you don't think that God had an anointing on this man's heart? That this man was an instrument to bring about God's divine will? Gutenberg stated that his idea came to him in a moment, an array of light. By the middle of the 16th century, the Latin Bible had been translated and printed into 14 other languages. It was around this time that a young scholar from England named William Tyndale came upon the scene. Sometimes called the father of the English Bible, Tyndale believed that people had the right to read and hear the scriptures in their own language. He eventually went to Germany, where he translated the New Testament from Greek into English, and it became the first printed English New Testament. Copies were smuggled into England and secretly purchased and read. Even though readers and owners were arrested, the scriptures kept flowing in. Tyndale went to Antwerp to work on a translation of the Old Testament, but before he had completed this work, he was betrayed, arrested, condemned a heretic, and publicly executed. His last words reportedly were, Lord, open the king of England's eyes. Tyndale's prayer was answered three years later. The first authorized Bible in the English language, called the Great Bible, was published as a result of King Henry VIII's injunction that an English Bible be placed in every parish. People flocked to the churches to listen to the reading of the scriptures in their own language. Early in the 17th century, King James I authorized a new translation of the scriptures. This translation, known as the Authorized or King James Version, is still read today, but it was only the beginning of English Bible translation. Since the Tyndale Bible, there have been close to 900 English translations or paraphrases of the Bible. This, coupled with versions in 2,000 other languages, makes the Bible the most read, most translated, and best-selling book in history. 
The fact that virtually anyone on earth can have the scriptures in their own language is due to the perseverance and sacrifice of those who never wavered from the belief that the Bible should be available to anyone who wishes to read it. However, that does not mean that every person on earth has open access to the scriptures. In some areas of the world today, the Bible continues to be seen as a revolutionary and dangerous book, and its publication or distribution is either highly monitored or banned outright. Many people can face persecution, imprisonment, or death for owning or teaching from the Bible. Perhaps you wonder why this book is so popular that people would risk their lives to obtain one. Those who do so believe that the Bible is more than simply a collection of stories or a book of history. They understand it to be the very Word of God, revealing His love, encouragement, and instruction to humanity. There is something about the Bible that draws spiritually hungry people to its pages and nourishes them. As long as the desire for the scriptures remains, there will be people like Jerome or Wycliffe or Tyndale who are willing to dedicate their lives to bring God's word to you. While studying the Bible, understand it's broken down into two parts, the Old and the New Testament. While not everything is easy reading, the first thing to understand is that prayer and a relationship with Holy Spirit are essential. You can start by just reading Genesis, the creation story, or the Gospel of John, which explains our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Some good tools during your study can be found at BibleHub.com and Blue Book Bible. You can break down the verse and get a deeper understanding by clicking on the tab for the Strong's Concordance for the Greek Lexicon, You can also see various translations from many common Bible versions, but don't be discouraged by the many versions. You see, the enemy, Satan, has tried to deceive us with endless versions of God's original word, which does make it confusing and fuel an argument that the Bible is false. Many of those versions change or remove key facts about Jesus, our Savior, and other important details. Personally, myself, I read the King James or the New King James. Other times I may refer to the more commonly used NIV, New International Version. But at the end of the day, I always say, I trust God. I need and want what he has for me. My heart is open, willing, and receptive. If you put me away in jail for life without any books... I will still get my Father's will and word. No man can stop what God has for me. The Spirit of God dwells within me. Let's dive deeper into that word inspired. Theopneustos. 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 When Jesus came, he explained about the Spirit of God within us we call the Holy Spirit, I get a personal understanding of what God teaching the early writers of the Bible might have felt like through my own experience with Holy Spirit. Let me share a quick testimony. I try to remind myself to pray before beginning a video, and I must admit I don't always do it. But this time I did, and Holy Spirit instructed me to do a Bible study. Now feeling a little pressure wanting to be obedient but at the same time having a loss of inspiration on how to begin this project I finally just stopped and prayed Father you see what's going on here and I want to honor you with obedience but I'm stuck I'm going to just need your help on this what are the chances that I just happen to need help and a brother in Christ from Truth Unedited at YouTube puts out a video on the very topics I was struggling with. And this is the brother whose work helped encourage me when I was making my channel last year to begin with. What are the chances that he used some of the same exact reasoning when talking to people about this topic? If our Heavenly Father has some instruction for me on how to worship Him and live my life, 
No man or thing can stop him from giving it to me. And I mean, did I say something wrong? Because if someone says to me, God's not able to get me a message, some instructions, a written book per se, full of instructions, because man on earth can stop him. At that point, I have to remind that person, God the creator can do anything. And to answer my rhetorical question about chances earlier, I don't subscribe to chances. I believe in faith. And my father is a God of his word. So I'm going to end this video soon. I'm not trying to rationalize God's inspired word anymore. But I am here to state again that it's a fact. And I want to give some additional advice on how to get closer to it. When I made my video called Genesis the second day, I did the following to get closer to the word. I fasted, I prayed, and I read some translations in Hebrew from the original Hebrew books called the Torah. It was hard because my Hebrew is minimal, but I did it because I believed that God would honor my efforts and help me with my video. Proverbs 25.2 it is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to seek out a matter. And I take that to mean God wants us to want truth. He gets glory from us doing so. Luke 8.17 It reads, For nothing is secret that will not be revealed, nor anything hidden that will not be known and come to light. The main goal of this world and Satan are to separate us from God. He will give us lies, deception, false doctrine teachers. But stay faithfully focused because God promises every truth and lie will come to light. If you have accepted Jesus as your personal savior, he says that we will be sent the helper, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, and with it, we will be led into all truth. But again, be reminded the enemy's goal, the world's goal, is to draw you away from our Heavenly Father. The Bible says that we are to be set apart or holy. So if you let things of this world lean heavy into your mind, into your life, into your beliefs, this will hinder your relationship with the Father and the Holy Spirit which will in turn hinder your ability to live in the fullness of his word and the promises he offers in that word. Let's take a moment and pray. Heavenly Father, you have said that if any man should desire salvation, that it will be found in the Lord Jesus. Because if anyone believes that Jesus died on the cross and rose again from the grave, that they who believe in their heart on Jesus, they would have eternal salvation. Father, if anyone is listening that has not yet accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior, I pray you will touch their heart right now and open their eyes to your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. In closing, please forgive me, but I'm going to be blunt right now. At times I speak gently, but often there's a time to be blunt. The Bible scripture is divinely inspired word of God. And Jesus Christ is the living word of God and the only salvation. And as long as we have Christ in our heart, we will never be without God's true and living word. Okay, now for the blunt part. That was just truth. Now it's time for the blunt truth. Friends, time is short. You need to get familiar. The world wants us to believe anything except the truth from our Heavenly Father. Listen, I'll tell you no lie. One day we'll all be gone from this life and behold the Heavenly Father. 
and for every denial of his every truth be forced to justify. Whether you're a baby boomer or millennial or Gen Zer, I promise you, whoever you claim to be, when the Savior returns, to those still in denial, the reality will come swiftly. Hail to the King coming in the clouds, so bright even a man void of sight will see.